what are the main uh, angles or the main themes of your work on, on innovation? Okay. Um, first, uh, let's talk about socio-economic justice. Mm -hmm. What I see as development is giving equal opportunity to all. It's very clear that equal opportunities cannot be given to all if they do not have access to food, mm -hmm. shelter, water, sanitation, medicines, etc. Okay. That is the essentials. Now, uh, in, in fact, that's why we invited you because I mean, clearly your work on innovation is about how innovation can contribute to uh, these fundamental rights having to do with uh, all these matters that you just mentioned. Exactly. Exactly. And there are two aspects to ensuring that people, everyone has access to this. One is to improve the distribution of existing, existing commodities. But another way is to create new commodities or improve the quality of existing commodities. So we have to talk about di efficient distribution of commodities available today, but and we access, always access to these exactly, commodities. Yes, yeah. absolutely access, and then think about what kind of commodities are we going to make available tomorrow to meet unmet needs or serve underserved markets dealing especially with mm -hmm. the poor. So innovation, I think, is very important, has a, a very important role to play in ensuring socio-economic justice because innovation is going to decide about what can be made accessible or available tomorrow by investing today. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is where innovation, I think, has a role to play in socio-economic and, and as an academic, did you start being interested uh, in innovation issues within mind, uh, this connection is existing between innovation and uh, somehow uh, uh, f facilitating the fulfillment of these uh, economic social rights and so on? Um, or did you start being interested in innovation per se? <laughs> Actually, I owe this to the French Research Service. I, uh, I did my PhD at Cornell University in mathematical economics. Mm -hmm. So, it so was very dry. Very dry. In fact, I remember presenting my thesis to my father, and uh, who is a professor of uh, international politics. And he told you, what is this? Uh, he, he told me, I'm sorry, my dear, but this, your thesis is of no use to man, God, animal, or plant. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was quite a harsh evaluation, but he said it with a smile. Then I landed up in France mm. in the French uh, Agricultural Research Service called INRA yes. in Grenoble. Now, Grenoble is a hot house of innovation in France. So when they saw my thesis, they said, what are we going to do with her? And so they said, look, why don't you do innovation? Why don't you do biotech? And I started with a study of the French strategy in biotechnology and the French have a very particular strategy which was very interesting and that made me realize how uh, we Indians, you know, basically South Asians, because of the English language, we don't know enough about the different strategies pursued by different European countries in keeping with their history and their needs. I think there's really a need to know more. So I was, that's how I got into innovation by studying the French strategy in biotechnology. And, and, and was your background in mathematics useful for you to be able to perform uh, in the field of innovation? Um, well, it, it, it was useful. Or was in the, it a, in a totally change of, uh, uh, of yes. pace of world and so uh, on? I was with a bunch of sociologists. And so initially, there was a fixed cost to pay in, to just understand each other. Okay. Already we economists have problems understanding each other mm -hmm. and put economists and sociologists together and I didn't know French also at that time. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting but what I found was that they had a very interesting way of looking at the relationship between innovation and development. This is basically the equal de mean in Paris. And there are uh, there are there is a famous sociologist called Bruno Latour, absolutely, okay, yes, yes, yes. who has who has really seen that technology and innovation does not emerge in vacuum. It's an endogenous process that is very much linked to the system, uh, which generates it and which will co determine its evolution. And uh, one a side product of that that's actually my 
that's now I realize that's my specialty and this is where my maths helped. I just listened to the sociologists and I got some programmers and I put their ideas together to analyze patent statistics and publications in very simple ways. In, I mean, I call it my iPod innovation mm -hmm. because I'm just putting together things that are very well known. But uh, the European Commission called us and they said, the way you have represented knowledge base in biotechnology of the UK, France and Germany. Based on your work? Yes, based on my work. It was very simple and it was showing where each country has a competitive advantage, where it has a comparative advantage and how it should invest in the short run in the comparative advantage but catch up, you know, be warned mm -hmm. that others are there in these fields. They said that this knowledge base is a notion which is very eclectic but to have it actually put in numbers, very simple numbers, and have an investment strategy based on those numbers was very useful. So they asked me to found a firm. So at the Ecole des Mines. Uh, no, no, uh, at the, uh, uh, the European uh, uh, Commission. Uh, yes. So here we 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 formed a, a firm, okay, and uh, because my co-authors took uh, pre-retirement, but actually uh, the. Uh, here we have an institutional problem because at that time now it's getting more and more open but people are not used to economists uh, doing anything useful mm -hmm. in the real world. Yes. They're used to economists giving advice, rules, complicated equations. You give something that people can understand. And which is going to be practical. Which is going to be practical. They say you're not a scientist, you're not a physicist, you're not a, you have not invented a new molecule. So here we had actually a lot of friction with the Mother Institute, which sort of regarded it at a very uh, shady uh, eye because unfortunately also outside of the United States generally, I find that um, the social sciences live in ivory towers with the rest of the stakeholders of society. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think my American education and also the social work I did while in America showed how closely different actors work together even within the academic milieu. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is still, this is coming up, this is what people are talking about here, but it's difficult to uh, replicate that culture even though we are moving towards it. So I had actually um, a lot of challenges, I mm -hmm. faced a lot of challenges mainly because I did something useful. Yeah. And, and, and that's how you, you little by little transition from the world of mathematics to the world of innovation. And then how did you transition from the world of innovation to the world of uh, economic and social rights, the world of development? The, the thing is, the, the, um, I think um, doing the firm, basically I'm just an honorary uh, advisor under something called the Alleg Law. It, the firm now supports 15, 12 of my uh, 12 employees out of which uh, some are my students, mm. old students from the business school in Grenoble. Uh, and, uh, so it I generates just, money? It generates money. It's, it's supporting people. I was very happy, but I, I, my, my idea was not to make money. Yes. So I just wanted to show that an economist could be useful. I'm very happy. That's yes. it. And at that time, what happened was that... Um, on the 26th uh, of December, I can never forget this. <laughs> Uh, my student called me up early in the morning and said something How horrible. How many years ago? This is 2000 and, uh, 2004, so, so that's seven. seven years ago. So she called me up early in the morning and she said, Madam Ramani, mm -hmm. um, there's something horrible that's happened in India. I know you're a Tamil mm -hmm. and uh, please, you know, I, I hope your family is all right. I said, what's happened? And I put on the TV, I saw the images of the waves, and I lost my voice mm -hmm. because my entire family was at the beach. Mm -hmm. So my, my husband, who is a cool-headed French engineer, yes. he had the common sense to call everyone on the mobile and found that they, there was, they had all been at a wedding and the water had stopped two kilometers from the temple. And they had seen everything, so the wedding was... So you're talking about the... Um, the, tsunami, the, the tsunami, the big Asian yeah, tsunami. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, they basically spent the day doing uh, good work, you know, they distributed all the wedding gifts. 
But I felt so thankful because in one wave, my entire clan, you know, Indians tend to have a very extensive family. The entire could family have, could, could have, have been wiped out. Mm -hmm. So I felt it, the time had come for me to give back to society. Mm -hmm. And so here, the, the Indian Prime Minister was very much criticized, Mr. Singh, because uh, in the Western world... He's still the Prime Minister. He's still yes, the Prime yes. Minister. Because Seven he, years later, yes. There was a basic problem of coordination. This revealed the problem of development. There was so much of goodwill pouring out. Unlike the Japanese tsunami, you know, the Japanese people who are a very... Um, you know, everybody's doing work, everybody's calm. In India, people are emotional. Mm -hmm. So everybody came out in the open, they started giving like in food. France. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. I'm sure the same thing would have happened in France. So there was a total problem of coordination because there was duplication of effort. There was enormous duplication of effort. So he had just said, please don't give anything till we know who needs what. Mm -hmm. And so here I started a project. It was called the Franco-Indian uh, reconstruction, reconstruction project. So let's do something long term. And though I have, you know, I had been studying industrial capabilities in biotechnology in developing countries by that time, I had known about India, but I had never put my little toe in a village or in a slum. Mm -hmm. So then I, I started touring around India, and here I realized how much we have a top down attitude. Because I have always been in social work, but then I'm comfortable. I say I must do something, and there's an a priori top-down attitude mm -hmm. towards dealing with them because we don't involve them in the development process, the targeted communities, and having to not write a paper but actually deal with real people. I understood how much more theory had to be created, mm -hmm. you know, in order to really understand the process of development. For example, you know, I go there feeling good and saying, I have, you know, 3,000 euros, what can I do for you? And so they tell me, look here, lady, if you want money, give it, okay? If you want to give us biscuits, no, we have received already enough, mm -hmm. okay? If you want to give us a job, tell us what you want. Anything else, you've got 10 minutes to tell us because our TV program is starting soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so life had completely come back to normal. And at the same time, I found that many villages, they had, you give us, we don't want to hear, you, we, they, they have a lack of social trust. Who mm -hmm. are you? You know? So how did you connect uh, this uh, human experience based on some dramatic events with, uh, or how does this human experience somehow shape your academic work, which is, as I see it, geared towards uh, uh, three types of issues. I mean... The, and the entry point being always innovation. I think that you, you think about innovation in connection with uh, global economic justice. That is to say, how is it possible for companies in the South to be able to, co first of all, to, 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 to appear and then to blossom and to compete with, uh, with companies from the North and to somehow serve uh, their own people in the South. So that's, I think, one angle that you have, innovation uh, geared towards justice, and global justice, economic justice. The, the other issue that I think uh, you are trying to, tackle, to tackle in your work has to do with innovation as, as a way to, as you said earlier, uh, facilitate access to, to, to certain goods which you feel are absolutely part of what is required for having your social rights being fulfilled. And more recently, no, you are now working on environmental justice. So, so tell us, first of all, quickly, how you connected this uh, human experience with your, your, uh, your, 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 your academic world in these three uh, areas and, and then tell us a bit about each of these three areas. Okay, I must just tell one thing. I come from a, I was educated in a Marxist university in Delhi, mm -hmm. okay, and I, I was Which very... Which university? Jawaharlal Nehru yes. University. Is it still a Marxist university? Uh, well, no, it's evolved a lot, but it was, it was kind of a, it was a kind of a Marxist in theory and Marxist as clubs, yes. okay. So there was a lot of social injustice meted out in reality by the communist groups, okay? But on theory, it was something else. So I was very disappointed. I wanted a theory that could help to understand the realities of the world without being an ideologist. Yes. And so this is what I found in uh, game theory, which was just treated very, um, 
uh, in a very simplistic way in the university, but which I really learned in the U.S. Mm. Game theory just says we are all playing games, mm -hmm. which means that we are in it, you have some interest, yes. I have some mm -hmm. interest, and we have to find win-win solutions. Mm -hmm. So basically, even though I looked at the process of innovation, it's always been through the optic of a game. That means that there is a system and there are different players. Mm -hmm. And the environment is also a non-strategic player, but sometimes it responds. Mm -hmm. Okay? There are tsunamis. So it was that game theory, the viewing the world not as a static, process, static point, but as a process which keeps on evolving due so to the, the thread, actions. It's the thread of your third equal world. Exactly. Okay, and this and is the thread which brings together your human, human experience and your academic companies. work. That's exactly yeah. it. Okay, so now what about your work on innovation as a way to tackle issues of economic justice, both at the local level, uh, but also uh, de facto also at the global level? So we have the process of innovation. We are in many multiple games, mm -hmm. okay, in which different actors are involved, but they are interlinked. So you have at the global level international organizations, then you have national organizations interacting with the global organizations. Then you zoom more. You have a national system of innovation mm -hmm. where you have firms, you have the state regulating, you have consumers, you have activists, and you have the consumers, potential consumers where, who can't pay. Where do you put the market? Uh, where do I put the market? Well, now you see before we had this impression that there were two ideal worlds, you know, either it would only be through the market, mm -hmm. only market propriet social justice, the Chicago school, you know, uh, against, Friedman, yeah. mm -hmm. or against everything them. has to be provided by the state which has to have controlled planning. Mm -hmm. Now what has happened, one of the interesting things is that even though liberalization was decried throughout the world, you know, starting from the 1990s with economic reform, uh, there are uh, the, the system in which we operate innovation has become more and more complex at mm -hmm. all levels. Mm -hmm. At the high-tech level, for example, public laboratories are competing with firms. Now, public laboratories can also take out patents. University researchers can take out patents. They are competing with firms over technology turf. Mm -hmm. In the low-tech, you know, in the markets or non-markets, potential markets dealing with the poorer communities, now firms are trying to get in, penetrate, it's called the BOP, bottom of the pyramid, yeah. how, to per, uh, how to penetrate that and they found that they can penetrate in a meaningful way only if they join hands with NGOs. Yes. So now we are having a variety of institutions, so you can't call a firm strictly a firm because it might be mm -hmm. also having a public laboratory, it might be having a foundation and an NGO mm -hmm. might be having links with the microfinance mm -hmm. but it might be also be the brand ambassador for a firm. But it seems to me what, uh, that one of your main concerns when it comes to innovation and economic justice at the local and global level is to really try to find out how it would be possible for firms, companies from the south to be able to really compete, I mean to exist and compete with the north. So uh, just to make it short, what, you know, what is your recipe, what is your roadmap for this to happen which is required for having a sense of economic justice being fulfilled at least in this domain. So what, what is your roadmap? Uh, there are two points in the roadmap. First, you see, developing countries just don't have the financial resources of developed countries. Mm. So it's better to look at the European countries uh, and see how European countries focus on niches. So each European country is focusing on a niche. In terms of population, some developing, some emerging economies might be very large. Let's take even nanotechnology. Unless there is a niche focus, it's not going to happen. Because so one recommendation, one recommendation, a niche focus. Second one. And, and, and how do you identify, we'll go back to the yeah. second one in a minute, uh, how do you identify this niche focus? I mean, uh, how do you identify the niche? It has, to be, it's, it's it's, it has to be through public dialogue. For example, you see, I say for India in nanotechnology, we are having a very, very dispersed strategy in nanotechnology. We have spent more on nanotechnology than on any other technology in the past because everybody is following the national nanotechnology initiative set up by the U.S. The Chinese... Which is not necessarily shooting 
the, exactly, the Indian needs. Exactly. Exactly. So the Chinese, you see, they have. We, I, I have to discuss China separately yes. because it's very interesting. I think Their it's policies a very good, are very different. Yes, I absolutely yes. agree. There are many things to learn from the Chinese for the uh, developing I, I, countries. I think that in the end, what it lacks uh, in India is a lack of public policy. There is, there is a public policy, but, but we, we can also even see. Uh, public policy in which there's more of a dialogue. There is now mm -hmm. something called the nano mission. It's coming. But everybody wants to do a little bit of everything. And that's not the way to go. You cannot go that way. You have to have a national strategy, some target points. You have to be on a mission mode so like the Green Revolution. So a niche is required for, for, for the identification of each niche. You need public dialogue. And uh, the content or the, 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 the focus or the of this public dialogue, how, how does it work? I mean, what could be an effective public dialogue I mean, leading towards identif uh, identification here, of a niche? Uh, I would say uh, pretty much what the French do, because here there was a, uh, you know, after France is very much resistant to many genetically modified plant varieties, and so for nanotechnology, they are taking a proactive uh, position. Many of the nanotechnology chambers are holding public dialogues so that they understand the fears and they remove any points that they consider to be based beliefs based on ignorance. Mm -hmm. So there are public dialogues. This is happening. But in India people are throwing tomatoes at each other instead of listening. But to I each mean other. Uh, how 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 is uh, is it possible for public dialogue to identify a niche which is going to be very effective in terms of creating a market okay. for this industry because this is probably yes, the key. Yes, this, this is probably the key. Here we can use techniques, we can use common sense as well as techniques like the one my company is doing, okay. which is based on publications and patents. But then, I what I see as based on common sense as a need is water remediation materials, okay, because if we've for example, if we invent a water purification, okay, which is based on nanotechnology, now everybody says they are based on nanotechnology, but if we make the, a cheap water filter, we can sell to the whole world and through sheer volume, we can, we can make a lot of money. So I really think Indian science, because it's so good, if it can be also, if they can have a mixed strategy, one, let everybody do what they want mm -hmm. according to their scientific interests. Another 50% devoted to national interest or global interest. Global interest, yeah. global interest for the poor. Okay. So I think that in India we have the means to do this and it's not directed. Why compete with the West on something? So, yeah. so, so a, a niche which offers you competitive and comparative advantage. Advantage. Okay, yeah. so that's the first element of your roadmap so that innovation uh, is able to, to service uh, the, the demands of, of, of economic justice at the local and global level, but with in mind uh, what is required for the staff. Uh, what is the second element? You talked you about will the second element. never guess this. Oh, well, okay. uh, <laughs> you know, go ahead. This is what the companies are saying. They are, and this is something that I have felt intuitively, but when I heard them say it, I understand. I keep on saying development is not just about having resources. It's about able to work together, to have mm -hmm. coordination mechanisms, to have what is known as soft skills, mm -hmm. to be able to criticize so a community people. spirit. Not even community, simple um, community sp communication skills mm -hmm. and not a competitive spirit, yes. a cooperative spirit, I mm -hmm. would say. Mm -hmm. Because within a firm, when you're working on a frontier field, you need to have social trust. You can't be competing. You have to share. You have to accept criticism, give criticism. You have to work as a team and not work to kill the other guy yeah. within the firm. So the firms actually, you see, I cannot mention the name, but a leading pharmaceutical firm told me that it is, I mean, I was interviewing them. They had bought out some firms in Europe and USA. So I asked the founder, sir, you know, if I see your patent portfolio, the companies you bought, okay, have nothing to do with your company. Why are you buying them? So he said, I'm not buying them for their patent portfolio. I'm sending four executives to this company in Europe and another four to the USA. I'm just saying, observe them. Observe how they cooperate. Observe how they work as a team. Observe how they build value for a firm together as a team mm -hmm. and come back to India. So the Chinese tell me that this is equally a problem for them. Mm -hmm. 
because you need to you need to have uh, this is not this is not about kowtowing this is about working together you know in a sort of synergetic way and we think that for example in many developing countries because they have been colonized for so long they either know how to kowtow too much to their superiors or look down upon their inferiors yeah. you know so they they have an us and me attitude too many vertical hierarchies mm -hmm. don't know how to work in a circular fashion don't know soft skills so, so subservient to the powerful and contemptful to the powerless exactly mm -hmm. which of course is not going to be working it's not going to be working we are in this world together we need each other mm -hmm. we have to listen to each other mm -hmm. we cannot be wasting our effort in monitoring one another but in creating value together so a very strong social and human component so this is okay at the core of uh, of uh, your Lack thinking of on innovation economic justice local global now second aspects of your work i'm trying to uh, push you a little bit second aspect uh, the, the connection uh, in your work between innovation and social justice once mm -hmm. again and and you just mentioned uh, earlier uh, the notion of uh, genetically modified uh, uh, food and this is at the center of your work in this area and of course there are all kinds of dilemmas because uh, it can be a good instrument to really give uh, access to, to food but there are also all kinds of ethical issues and so on and so on. So tell us a bit about this and in the context also of, of the, uh, in the, in the, in the context of the South. Okay, the, uh, what I can say is the, the, the groups are very polarized, so polarized, uh, there's a lot of asymmetry of innovation, uh, information, we don't know who is telling the truth. Because everybody is claiming, so there are people who are claiming that only genetically modified plant varieties can save the South and ensure food availability. There are others who are saying that this is a big risk. It, uh, about more than 90% of the patents in the cereals are held in the hands of five, six firms. We are selling... Which are northern firms. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. The granaries of the South to the North. They're saying organic farming can work. And then there are environmentalists who are saying, whatever you do, not a chemical farming. So this right now, I'm trying to see who is saying what and what affiliation do they have. Yeah. All I can say is the jury is not out yet. Yeah. So I think we have to follow Europe and apply the precautionary principle. I think southern countries which don't want to be pushed into genetically modified plant varieties by U.S. interest mm -hmm. have to join forces with Europe. But, but in the past, you know, once again, it's not my field, but in the past, I mean, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, we have been able to, uh, to, to address the issue of, uh, of food through the, the Green Revolution. So why is it that now we are uh, talking about uh, genetically, modi genetically modified food I mean, uh, products as a way to tackle this, uh, this food issue? The, basically, the Green Revolution is very chemically intensive. Oh, it was. It is still, yeah, it's still, and it needs water. So, and it has to have a critical mass, land mass. Mm -hmm. So, what happened, for example, in India is Punjab, the wheat bowl of India, it's going to be a desert, apparently. So there was a very, very huge cost very to the, huge to the green environmental revolution. cost because so you we see, were able to feed people, but in the process, we we killed nature. We could have, and th this is a tragedy because it was so evident very soon that the Indian government today, for example, it spends more on giving subsidy on fertilizers to small farmers to keep their wood so the, than on research yeah. in agriculture. But this tragedy which has been, so, so it's interesting because I didn't know, I didn't know about this, so, so it has been a, a plus and a minus. Uh, is, it, is it an experience which has, been, which has also been the one of developed countries? Because, I mean, uh, way, you know, developed countries, in, uh, agriculture is highly industrialized. And, and so have we also ex been exposed to this kind of uh, two sides uh, uh, story? In, in some places, yes. But there has been far more regulation okay. because the farmer's lobby is not so important in the, in the West. It is important, mm -hmm. but it's not the most important. In an agrarian society like India, a farmer's lobby is everything. Mm -hmm. for votes and in a so democracy. the lobby worked against regulation uh, the lobby the people didn't even think of regulation because they just wanted the lobby it was the environmental activists who were working mm -hmm. to lobby so the, for the, the, regulation the, the, okay and uh, what it also 
created a lot of budgetary deficits for the for the government because you see the large farmers with mm -hmm. the green revolution suddenly their productivity increased they dumped the market mm -hmm. the prices came down small farmers then had to exit the market then where would they go in india already we are having too many people in the cities mm -hmm. so they set a government procurement program to ensure that the small farmers can yeah. stay in uh, what is, uh, is uh, what are the lessons of this story for africa because okay. you see at the moment you know the paradox of african societies that they are to a certain extent uh, agricultural societies and yet they import yes. most of the food and therefore something which is a huge burden on 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 the public i mean it's, it's it's a problem so and something has to be done and at the moment nobody knows what should be done so what are the lessons negative and positives uh, positive of of this uh, southeast asian story the south the Asian story, the thing is, we have to have South-South cooperation in public research. There are a lot of uh, public researchers who are interested in helping the South. The entire Green Revolution was due to good people in the Rockefeller Foundation, okay, and the Ford Foundation. And they came to developing countries. They were really interested. They gave it almost free, you see. It was a good public-to-public -public cooperation. Now, in all countries, the base, the knowledge base in agriculture has moved from the public sector to the private sector. How, how do you explain that? And, and, and what are the, the, the plus and minuses of the situation? Uh, the, the thing is, uh, they, the public sector concentrated, was so happy with the Green Revolution, it concentrated on becoming better and better and better in the Green Revolution technology. That's one. And the second thing is that in the public sector, in all developing countries, it was something that's not openly said, but everybody knows it's lack of meritocracy. You see, before the people who headed the Green Revolution, they were dedicated men. There was a sort of motivation. Mm -hmm. Then as these men passed and the organizations grew, within the organization, there is a lack of incentives. There are many, many good researchers in the world. Mm -hmm. All they want is recognition, not money. Yes. So these institutions do not have incentive schemes that really identify meritocracy. If recruitment and promotion is based on social networks, caste identifications, community identifications, ethnic identifications in Africa, then you see people are going to move to find social justice yes. into multinationals. Yes. Because a multinational doesn't care what your origins are. If you're good, it takes you. Yes. And if you're good, it promotes you. So it is a real paradox. So, so institutions which are dedicated to the public good somehow uh, kill the ability to serve the public good, but somehow uh, being populated by people who are not really uh, hired on the basis of, you know... Who are not able to stimulate. And you see, there's a whole so idea. So culture of entitlement develops. Exactly. And, and, and it's killing the public yes. sector. So now for Africa, you see, we and, must and, and revive. No, yeah, and no, but nobody uh, saw this happening. Uh, in India, no, well, they all knew it. But you see, the good people, you see, the good people who really were feeling bad, they moved on to working for Monsanto or Syngenta mm -hmm. or DuPont. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the in India, for example, most of the agricultural researchers, see, they know that they, they can't get money. They were paid more too, perhaps. Uh, the salaries were probably better. It's not only salary. People have told me again and again, it's not only the salary. So it was a dynamism. Uh, exactly. Of, 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 uh, of, of recruitment and uh, promotion. But, uh, mm -hmm. They wanted meritocracy. They wanted dedicated heads. Mm -hmm. They didn't want people who were sitting in commissions. They wanted real scientists who were promoting real science. So now I'm saying if this is the case and the public sector has shrunk, then let's cooperate. Let's cooperate more with Africa. Let's why And here again, you see, China is very interesting, but it's China for itself. China is the only country, and it happened for nanotechnology. They found out nanotechnology. They wanted to leapfrog into nanotechnology. They had missed the bus on biotechnology. So what they did is, first, they went for complete academic reform. Mm. And they made sure politicians are totally dissociated from public institutes. They made it open to foreigners. My student from Maastricht who went to China, he said he had never heard so many professors coming from the USA. Yes. 
anywhere else in the world except in the University of Beijing. Mm -hmm. So he said there are so much uh, external visitors, there are so much of people going abroad, there is such transparency in recruitment and promotion, it's all very clear and they've even titled the journal, there is, there might be corruption but it's minimal. It's much, it has nothing to do with the system before. Because they, they are trying to put in place uh, a system which is going to secure them to win. And that's it. And because you see, if you want to do good innovation, you must have good scientific skills. They are not able to, uh, however, they don't have a venture capital and they don't have the culture of transformation of science into good technology yes. mm -hmm. and then into innovations. So the Chinese are trying to have the public sector operate yes. from A to Z. Yes. But in India, you see, we are just throwing money into A to Z scientific niches without any coordination mm -hmm. and without any academic reform. But, 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 but in India, I think, I mean, you know, that's one of the differences that I see between China and India. In, in, in China, clearly, because I spent quite a bit of time in China, there is uh, a very, very strong and, and uh, a real commitment to the future uh, geared, I mean, through public policy. In China, uh, in India, I don't know the extent to which there is a true commitment to public policy uh, uh, combined and, and dovetailed with dynamism beyond words. I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would think yeah, that actually I, I think beyond are, words, it's, 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 it's very it's, little. It's really, uh, you're very right. What I think the hope in India is are dedicated individuals. Mm -hmm. I find dedicated individuals in the government, in companies, in NGOs, in activist groups. So before I was, you know, I was having a sort of black picture, I, it's no longer that way. So what we have to do is, thanks to the internet, thanks to focus groups like this, you know, we are talking, yeah. it's mm -hmm. going to be put. You see, I think it's, it's in India, it's a rude bargaining, yes. I would say. It's a rude bargaining between different vested interests. What do you mean rude bargaining? I'm saying this is a time when we are at a crossroads in India mm -hmm. and there are different vested interests bargaining mm -hmm. to see which way the horse is going to go. And why, why rude? Because it's... It's, uh, it's open, it's ugly, mm -hmm. it's, it's very rude, mm -hmm. you see. Whereas in China, there's no bargaining because it all takes place inside a black box at the top. Yeah, and, and, and they have a plan. And they have a plan, but it's a black box. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And then yeah, what they have is, I, they have this black box of policy here, and then they have this great freedom in the scientific field, but not in the social sciences. Yes. I am not able to get any Chinese researcher to join my access to medicines group because innovation is not only technological, mm -hmm. it can also be organizational, you see, it can be institutional, it can be a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. So you can't in China talk about uh, anything, criticize anything mm -hmm. about public delivery and still be but, in China. But I think we are beginning to think about it. I was on a panel a few uh, weeks ago on uh, technology innovation and institutional innovation. And I think that we are beginning to realize that unless they, 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 they bridge the two, I don't think that they're going to, I think they are, they are beginning to realize that unless they do so, they will not be go, able to go as far as they plan to go. Well, one thing is uh, interesting in China, I found when my visits to China, I mean, barring, uh, I'm sure, activists who are in jail and all that, most of the common people that I talked with, mm -hmm. they don't really care. Yeah, absolutely. They don't care. They are watching uh, American sitcoms translated uh, into Chinese with Chinese actors. They have their vacation. Mm -hmm. They just want to watch TV, work, have their vacation. And have a better economic life. Uh, have That's a better so. life, yes. So nobody's really bothered. So they're saying, yes, you know, there's some people bothering about human rights. Poor things. Mm -hmm. And then they go to jail. No, no, no. <laughs> you know? no, 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 absolutely. So, so they don't care. I think people all over the world are like that, more mm -hmm. or less, you know. But uh, this is, there is still a root bargaining in India mm -hmm. because that level of economic prosperity trickling down hasn't occurred. Now, I haven't gone to the interior uh, mid, uh, mid, uh, middle of the country in China where there is apparently enormous poverty. Yes. Because I don't know Chinese. I've been mm -hmm. taken mm -hmm. by guides only to mm -hmm. the good places. Whereas uh, I think in India, it's, it's such regional disparities while they exist yes. between North and they're not so evident.